Good afternoon or morning or hope you guys here, those of you at all of our campuses and then folks watching online or TV, we are glad you're here today, getting ready to go into the summer. Now, I don't know where you're at in the world, maybe you're going into the winter. Here in South Florida, it is hurricane season. Woo! Aren't we excited about that? You know, we're in this series and we're talking about the difference between real and fake. There are a lot of fake things in our world. And whether it be tennis shoes or whether it be designer bags or whether it be electronics, I was thinking this week about gold. Because there is, of course, real gold. And then there's, well, there's sterling silver with gold paint on it. And sometimes it's difficult to tell the difference from the outside. Right? And then when it comes to gold, there's not just gold. There's 10 karat gold and 14 karat gold and 18 karat gold and 22 karat gold and 24 karat gold. And if you were to look at your jewelry and discover what carat or whether it was sterling silver, maybe dipped in gold, however it is created, there's a difference in fake and the real thing so i was amazed i was looking i really didn't know but do you know the difference between 10 karat gold and let's say 24 karat gold or 10 karat gold and 14 karat gold it's really the amount of gold that is in the piece of jewelry or the coin or whatever it is that you have so if you own a 10 karat necklace or ring it has 41.7% of it is gold. In other words, almost 60% of it is silver or some other kind of mineral. If you have a 14 karat gold chain or ring or watch or whatever, it's 58.5%. So it's just a little over half of its weight is gold. 18 karat is 75%. 22 karat is 91.6%. And then, of course, 24 karat gold is 99.99% solid gold. And they don't make jewelry out of 24 karat gold very often because it's so soft and it, 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 you know, it doesn't keep its shape very often. As I was thinking about it this week, in 2008, Stephanie and I were given a gift. Each one of us were given a gold coin by uh, a friend that uh, actually is Pastor Frank. If uh, he, he was an attorney and God nudged his heart to go and start a church, and I, I, you can't see it, but it's a 2008 gold coin, and it says it's a $50 piece, but it's got one ounce of gold in it. So do you know how much it's worth? Almost $2,000. Gold is trading at like $1,899 an ounce. So, pretty good Christmas gift, wasn't it? All right, got two of them. Um, but anyways, what's amazing is that the way in which gold um, is counted or the way in which gold is, you might say, made, the Bible says that as Christ followers, there are a lot of things in common. In other words, there are some of us who may be just sterling silver. In other words, we're, we're painted as Christians, we're religious, but we've never been transformed. We don't really know Christ, we just know about him. There are others that maybe you've trusted Christ, but you're just a 10 carat Christian. In other words, you got a little bit of Christian in you, but 60% of your life, well, it's the world. Maybe you're an 18 carat. But what the Bible wants is for us to become 24 carat gold Christians because that is where everything you're looking for is to be found. And I wanted to look at what's real and what's fake in the context of something we all face and that we all deal with and that's suffering because everybody suffers don't they everybody goes through difficulties and challenges i mean how many of you in the last couple of years have suffered in some way let me see your hand all right all right those of you who don't have your hand raised let me come to your house suffering follows me wherever i go all right <laughs> but, but it's one of those things. And not only is it something that we all have in common, here's the deal. Real 24 karat Christians handle it differently than those who are just painted gold. 
There's a real difference between real and fake when it comes to suffering. So there are two kinds of suffering the Bible talks about. And I, uh, I put it like this. Here's the first one. And you, if you want to follow along, you can download the outline. It's on the app. If you're watching online, you can get it at potentialchurch.com. But number one is circumstantial suffering. In other words, the kind of suffering that you really had nothing to do with. You didn't make a decision. You didn't do something stupid. It might be illness. It might be a hurricane. It might be the loss of somebody you love or care about. Maybe you lost a job, but it wasn't because of anything you did. Maybe it's financial challenges or struggles. It's just circumstantial. It's just that all of a sudden you're going along and then you find yourself really having a hard time because of something that's happened around you. Paul is a great example of this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, here's what he says. He says, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me. And maybe you can relate. The thorn in the flesh. In other words, he was saying there, I, I was given pain. Some people think it was the fact that he struggled to see. Other people thought that it was relationships. The Bible doesn't tell us. It just says that all of a sudden Paul is dealing with suffering and it's a torment. And he's like, this thing is from the devil. And again, can't you relate? I mean, isn't there certain things that come into your life and you're like, man, this is causing me great pain and it's got to be from the devil. That new neighbor that moved in when you bought your dream house. Right, or the supervisor that just came to your company. I mean, whatever it is, all of a sudden now you're going through some real challenges and it's got nothing to do with the decision that you made. He says in verse 8, three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. In other words, it's not a bad decision. It just, it just came from out there and it's affecting me in a big way. But the other kind of suffering is the result of your faith. In other words, I call it Christian suffering. It's the result of a stance that you have taken, a decision that you have made because of your faith. In 1 Peter, it really is written about suffering. And it's written about suffering that is the result of the Roman government persecuting Christians. It's because they were Christians. It's during the end of Nero's reign. And Nero, you might remember, is the one who'd throw him into the lion's den or watch him fight the wild animals or watch him fight some of their soldiers. And so Peter is writing this to people who are in the midst of that kind of suffering, that kind of challenge. Listen to what he says. He says, dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you're going through as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad for these trials make you, because they make you partners with Christ in his suffering so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it is revealed to all the world. Now, we'll talk about what that means in a moment because don't just read past that. I mean, think about your own suffering. And you think about sometimes how frustrated we get when we have a flat tire or when the air conditioner goes off. Peter is writing to some folks who just, a, a wife who just lost her husband because of his faith, because he was serving God and got thrown into the lion's den. He, he's writing to Christians that are just waiting for the Roman guards to come and knock on their door. And so every day they get up with a great sense of fear because of their faith. All they had to do is renounce Christ. And all of the fear would be gone. And he says... That in some way, there's a capacity to experience joy. So that must mean <laughs> there's a big difference the way 24 karat Christians actually experience this suffering. He says, if you suffer, however, this is pretty interesting, it must not be for murder, stealing, making trouble, or prying into other people's affairs. In other words, if you're suffering just because you're an idiot, just because you're doing something stupid, making a bad decision... Just because you're trying to get away with... He says, listen, that's not what I'm talking about. I, I, I'm not talking about as a result of a bad decision. He says, but it is no shame to suffer for being a Christian. Praise God for the privilege of being called by his name. And so he's talking about the fact that you lose your job at work because you take a stand. In other words, they ask you to do something that violates Scripture. 
they uh, ask you to respond in a way, whatever it is, and you take a stand. You're like, I, I can't be a part of that. I don't support that. That's, that's, I, I don't believe that that's the right thing. And they say, well, we're sorry about that, and they let you go. That's suffering. Because now all of a sudden, you've got all of these concerns financially and family. Maybe it's because of a stance you take for your faith, and you get attacked nowadays maybe on social media where people try to come at you or cancel you or whatever. Maybe it's family. They're always all over you. Why in the world are you down at that church? Why are you serving? Why are you giving? Why are you sending your kids? Why are you doing all of these kind of things? Or maybe even financial decisions. Now, as a result of those two kinds of suffering, I put this question in your outline. How does a Christian handle suffering? I mean, what's the difference between 24 karat and painted gold, sterling, silver. And there is a huge difference. That's, this is how, again, this is how we can know who we are when we look into the mirror. Am I the real thing? Or am I just pretending? Because see, from a distance, it's difficult to tell. I mean, I can look and see the color of gold, but I have no way of telling whether or not the, what you have on is the real thing or not. The same thing sometimes is true with our faith from a distance it may look real but on the inside it may just be religion so how do 24 karat christians handle suffering they remain under i i like to illustrate it with this uh, umbrella here because it's that same idea is that christians i know it's bad luck all right don't freak out they remain under. Most people don't, right? Suffering is not something that we enjoy. It's not something that we want to be a part of. And so rather than stay here, we tend to try to get rid of it. Christians don't. I don't mean that they look forward to it or they celebrate it. Woo! Trouble's coming. No, no. But they don't run from it. They're not look see some people spend their whole life because everybody's going to suffer and some people spend their whole life trying to figure out how to get out from underneath the suffering that they're experiencing in the present day you talk every time you talk to them life is miserable and they're trying to figure out how to make it not so miserable right but not 24 karat gold christians let's look there's some great examples jesus being the first one in luke chapter 22 this is before jesus goes to the cross and i don't know about you but i'd consider the cross suffering Father, Jesus says, if you're willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. He's like, I don't want to be under here. I don't want to deal with this pain and this hurt and this agony. If you look down in verse 44, it says he prayed so fervently, his sweat turned to blood. In other words, it wasn't something that he wanted to experience. But then there's this phrase. Father, if you're willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet... I want your will to be done, not mine. What was Jesus saying? Saying, this is not exactly where I want to be, but I'm going to remain under. I want your will to be done. Jesus is not the only one. Paul said the same thing. Remember, Paul said this thorn, this suffering, I asked three times for the Lord to take it. Well, what was God's response? Verse 9 tells us, each time he, God, said, my grace is all you need, Paul. My power works best in weakness. So now I'm glad to boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ can work through me. And then in verse 10 he says, that's why I take pleasure in my weakness and in my insults and in my hardships. And remember what he's talking about. Because he told us just in the verses before, he's talking about that thorn. He's talking about that suffering. In other words, Paul says, I asked God three times and God said that his strength would be enough in my weakness. In other words, there was a purpose for my suffering. And so Paul said, what? I'm going to remain under. He doesn't curse God. He doesn't run from God. He says, I'm going to remain under. So there's Jesus, there's Paul, but there's also Peter. Remember, Peter's the dude writing to a bunch of Christians who are really going through it because of the Roman persecution. And in chapter 4, verse 1, he says, so then... Since Christ suffered physical pain, you must arm yourselves with the same attitude he had and be ready to suffer too. What's Peter saying? You need to be ready to remain under. 
rather than spend your whole life focused on how to get out from underneath gold, 24 karat gold, Christians remain under. Now you might ask a good question. Why in the world would they do that? What's the benefit of remaining under? I mean, why not? I mean, I thought the whole reason for being a Christian is to be able to get away from suffering, is to experience blessing. Well, again, let's look at what the Bible says. Why remain under? Well, it's because here's the way gold is refined. It's put into a furnace. And the fire separates the gold from whatever the other minerals are. So the only way you will ever get 24 karat gold is to put it in the furnace. And one of the reasons that you and I as Christ followers are willing to remain under is because we know we are being refined. That we are becoming something that God has created us to be because 24 karat gold is of greater value than 10 karat. It's of greater value than sterling silver with some gold dye on it. And the same thing is true in your life and in mine. There is greater value in remaining under and becoming something. The joy that you and I look for is on the other side of this transformation. Happiness is on the other side of suffering. Listen to what Job. Now, I don't know if you know Job. All right, it's spelled J-O-B. Some people think his name is Job, but it's Job, okay? He went through suffering big time. First of all, he was hugely blessed. Everybody was jealous of him. I mean, he had a big house. He had a great family, awesome job, and lots of money in the bank. And then he lost it all. He lost it all. Listen to what he says in his suffering. He says, and when he, God, tests me, I will come out as pure as gold. He says, there's something happening in this suffering. I don't enjoy it. I'm not looking forward to it. But it's not being wasted. Something is happening. And why is this happening? He says in verse 11, For I have stayed on God's path. I have followed His ways. I have not turned aside. I have not departed from His commands, but have treasured His words more than daily food. So let's look at some of this 24 karat gold. Let's look at some of the transformation that happens as we remain under. It's what, it's what motivates us. It's what reminds us to remain under. It's why the real thing looks a lot different than the fake thing in the midst of suffering. All right? Here, here, here's, here's the first one. Is we remain under because we realize that we're discovering what we really trust in. We're discovering basically who we really are. Did you know? Now, I don't know if maybe this is not true for you. We tend to lie to ourselves. We, we do, and, and when we lie to ourselves, we convince ourselves that we're not lying to ourselves. Right? I mean, you, you, I mean, some of you probably looked in the mirror this morning and thought, wow, I look pretty good. I, I look at you every weekend. I'm saying, of course, you get to look at me too. It goes both ways. Right? So you ever lied to yourself and said, well, I'm just going to eat one? Or you lie to yourself and you say, you know, I'm going to start working out next month. I mean, you, you, you convinced yourself you were telling the truth, but the reality is it wasn't until next month you knew you were actually lying. We lie to ourselves. Well, the reality is, is when we get put into the furnace, when we get put into the fire, we discover who we really are. I, I put it like this. When I suffer, there's a separation between my commitment to God and my commitment to other things because they can't remain together. See, gold is incredible. If, if you're wearing a 10-karat uh, gold chain, it's being held together. In other words, the, the other metal, whatever kind of metal it is or mineral, is right there with the gold. They're stuck together. You can't pull them apart. I can't, you can't give me your necklace and me just say, okay, here's the gold and here's the silver. No, no, they're together. But you put that in a furnace and that gold will separate itself from that silver. See, it's the same thing as Christ followers. When things are going okay, we can say we're trusting God when in reality there are other things that are really the priority. 
And it's hard to tell that they're not. You really believe. Man, we sing those songs, right? Lord, I love you. I'm here. I'll do anything. I mean, remember Peter? Peter went to Jesus himself. And Peter's an apostle, right? Pretty big dude. He wrote a lot of the scripture we're reading this morning. And he's like, you know what? Jesus, I'm with you, man. If I have to die, I'll die. And remember what Jesus' response? It wasn't like, whew, I'm so glad you're on my team, Peter. What did Jesus say? He said, you know what, Peter? Here's the truth. You're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. And was Peter like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe that I, I'm so sorry. No, he's like, no, nope, that'll never happen. No, you don't understand. You're number one in my book, God. But we all know that when Peter got into the furnace, what happened? He discovered what he really trusted in. And it wasn't Jesus. He wasn't the priority. And the same thing is true for you and I. See, it's real easy to believe that God is the priority of our lives or that he is where my trust is until we get put into the furnace. Let's go back to that job. You know, that job that when they begin to do something that you know violates scripture and they ask you to okay it or participate in it. So let me ask you, do you have greater faith in that job to provide for you and your future or in Christ and his word to provide for you and your future. See, that's when you're really in the furnace because it really gets divine. You discover that. Now, I'm not judging you. I, I mean, ooh, that's hot. But that's reality. That's the difference between real and fake. 10 karat gold, doesn't matter how much that 10 karat gold says, I'm really 24 karat. I really am. When it gets put into the furnace, it is discovered. And the same is true for me, and the same is true for you. When you get thrown in, when you're facing whatever it is you discover, it, it, look what the scripture says. It says in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said, No one can serve two masters. Either you hate one, love the other, you be devoted to one, despise the other. Here he uses money, but it could be anything. He says you can't serve both God and money. In other words, in, when everything's okay, you can say, I love God and Love money at the same time. But when all of a sudden things get really challenging and you're thrown into the furnace, which one I love more will come to the surface? And I get to discover that. Now, what I do with that, well, that's up to me. But that's why 24 karat Christians, when they go through suffering, while they don't look forward to it, nor are we like, woo, woo, they realize that as they're going through it, they're discovering something about themselves they couldn't have discovered without the suffering. And without the transformation, we'll never experience the joy of becoming who God created us to be. So it's necessary. So they respond different. See, they don't run from it because they know that where they want to get, they have to go through. That in some sense, it's actually an opportunity. It's just like, let's say you don't lose the job because of standing up for your faith. Let's just say you lose a job. One day they come in, they say, hey, you know what? It's difficult days. We're going to have to let you go. And all of a sudden, in that moment, you're in the furnace now. Right? And you get to discover, you know what happens a lot of times to those who are not 24 karat, those who are not real? They then get mad at God. Well, where are you, God? See, it's difficult to commit and to trust in either one of those situations. It's, either, it's very difficult to trust God enough to take a stand for your faith when you know it could cost you something that's valuable. It's also difficult to continue to trust God when it seems out of nowhere something that is valuable to you has been taken. Like with that, but you find out, don't you? You find out what you really value and what you really trust. You and I can look into the mirror and pretend to be something that we're not, but you can't in the furnace. When you're really hurting, I'm not talking about you stubbed your toe on the way to the bathroom this morning. I'm talking about you're really hurting. You really find out. Because those who are just sterling silver, they'll curse God. They'll run from God. They'll give up on God. As opposed to embrace him. To trust him. So, one of the reasons that Christians respond different is because they understand that they're finding something out about themselves, which number two means that they're able to celebrate the fact that they're making progress. You know, suffering, trials, it's like, 
it's the consequences sometimes or even the discipline that helps us to grow. Here's what I mean by that. As if you're a parent or a coach or a gardener, you know this. Well, let me talk to the parents or those who have had parents or have watched a TV show with parents. Good parents have to do what? They have to do some things that their children are going to look them in the eye and say, you're making me suffer. I can't believe you would do that, Mom. I can't believe you would do that, Dad. I, I, this hurts. This is suffering. You mean I can't go? You mean you're not going to give me the money? You mean, you, what? Right? That's what good parents do. Why do good parents do that? Because good parents know that to, so that, that their children can progress to become the people that will lead to the very thing they want, that child wants, they need to suffer. It's the only way. Kids who are not disciplined often don't become successful. The same is true for coaches, right? If you're going to be a great coach, I played a lot of basketball in my time, and I can tell you, I had some coaches that I just hated, and the reason I hated them is because they made me suffer. They made me run. We had one coach, if we played bad, before we could go to the dorm, we would have to go to the gym and practice. We had a coach that made us do all kinds of drills. I, I didn't like that coach, but I will tell you, it is those coaches that made me a better basketball player. I had other coaches I loved. They'd roll the ball out and say, play. That's what we'd do for two hours. I really liked those coaches, but I didn't become a better basketball player because they were unwilling to make me suffer. See, one of the great things about suffering, while we don't look forward to it, we don't enjoy it, we don't want it, but as a Christian, you and I respond differently to it is because we know that we are progressing this is the opportunity in which to become that which you've been praying to be. It is the opportunity in which to experience what God has promised. Jesus is our ultimate example. Hebrews chapter 12. Um, let's read about it. It says, for our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years, doing the best that they knew how. Right? Parents are not perfect. Coaches are not perfect. Gardeners, you know, when they're pruning and cutting, you know, it's weird. These tree people come and they cut the tree to make the tree healthier. Like, no, you're cutting the tree. That doesn't, right? They understand, but they're not perfect. He says, but God's discipline is always good for us. Why? So that we might share in his holiness. No discipline is enjoyable while it's happening. It's painful. But afterward, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. So take a new grip. Your tired hands and strengthen your weak knees. In other words, this Bible understands it's not a pleasant experience to remain under. But remaining under, you're growing, you're maturing. And as a result, on the other side is the joy or happiness or peace, whatever word you want to use, that you've been praying for. That you have been pursuing. Uh, let me... Let me show you first of all let's word how it works out in first peter he says so then since christ suffered physical pain you must arm yourselves with the same attitude he had be ready to suffer too and then here's the part for if you have suffered physically for christ you have finished with sin interesting you've finished with sin you won't spend the rest of your lives chasing your own desires but you'll be anxious to do the will of god You've had enough in the past of evil things that godless people enjoy. Immorality, lust, uh, feasting, drunkenness, wild parties, terrible uh, worship of idols. Now think about it. This is awesome, right? Peter's saying, look, you're going through pain just like Christ did. But what is the process of going through this pain doing in you? It's killing sin. And sin is what? Well, according to James, sin is, is what leads to death. Years ago, before all the social media stuff, we did a series called I've Screwed Up.com. And it was a series where people could go online and they could post a confession. And because it was before social media, we did interviews on CNN. I mean, all over the world. <coughs> it's pretty amazing. But here's what surprised me. Is when these people would go online and nobody knew who they were, they didn't go online defending themselves for pornography or for an affair 
You know what over and over again I would read? Is that they wanted to know how to get free of it. The pornography that had control of their lives for the last five or ten years. The fact that they told everybody that they could stop, but they didn't. The fact that some substance, they couldn't let it go. Or the affairs that they continued to have. Or the lust that overwhelmed their life and hurt their marriage. Or the anger that seemed to ruin every day. They wanted to know how to let it go. Do you hear what Peter is saying? Peter is saying the reason you and I, if we're real, respond different to suffering is because suffering is killing those things in our lives. It's getting ready, rid of those things in our lives that we have foolishly pursued, believing that in the end they will make us happy. But if you've pursued any of them for very long at all, you know they don't. And he says those things are dying so that that which brings real joy is gaining strength, is being matured and grown in us, right? It's not a pleasant process. That's why you, you don't hear, when's the last time you heard anybody talk about suffering in this sense? Most of the time, it's how to avoid it. It's how to get through it. It's how to, it's how to get away. But suffering plays an important role in the life of a Christian, so they respond differently. They, they, they act differently because, and, and it's the last one, and I put it in your outline, is it brings joy. Like I said, Jesus is our example. He says, we do this, what, suffer. How? By keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith, because of what? The joy. The joy wasn't in the cross, no. The joy was on the other side. The joy awaiting him, he endured the cross. He endured the cross because he knew the joy was on the other side. And Christians, guess what? We are following in the footsteps of Christ. And we, too, endure, which is not a pleasant experience, suffering because we know that the joy or the happiness that we're pursuing is on the other side. Everything you're looking for is on the other side of the suffering you're presently going through. That's why the enemy does everything he can to get you to put down the umbrella. To get you to get out from underneath it. And whether it be by distraction or numbness or however it might be. He just wants to get you out from underneath it. Because he knows ultimately if you endure, the real joy you're looking for will be discovered. Why? Because we're following in his steps. You, you, you notice it says, now he is seated in a place of honor beside God's throne. We're following that example. The honor, the joy, the peace that you're looking for, that I'm looking for, is on the other side. We read in Peter, so be truly glad. There's a wonderful joy ahead, even though we must endure these trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is what? It's real, it's genuine. It's being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Through your faith, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold, so when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you what much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. Everything you're looking for is on the other side of suffering, that whether someone's a believer or not, whether they're real or fake, they're going to suffer. It's a part of fallen humanity. The only way God can take away our suffering is to turn us into individuals who don't have the freedom to choose. And because we have free choice, there's difficulty in this world. Things that happened a long time ago can sometimes make today difficult for different people. So how do you remain under? Last thing. He says two things. I'm not going to read this whole scripture, but I put it there because I think this is a subject that it's good to go back and look at. He says, dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you're going through as if something strange were happening to you. So, so if you and I are going to remain under, here's the first thing. Don't be surprised. See, don't be surprised. See, we tend to be surprised. We tend to act like, oh my gosh, there must be something wrong because I'm going through difficulty. This is not fair. Where are you, God? See, those who aren't real, when they go through tragedy, you know what happens to most couples? They separate. They get pushed and out. The pain pushes them apart. But do you know what happens to the real thing? 
they become more intimate on the other side of the challenge of staying together. See? And how do they do that? Don't be surprised. Don't be surprised that when you are going through a difficulty, right? You know what the scripture says? The scripture says that grief, it doesn't say don't grieve because grief doesn't have the capacity to destroy you. But surprise does. Surprise causes us to make bad decisions when we're unexpectedly uh, dealing with something that we thought wouldn't happen to us as Christ followers. She says, don't be surprised. And then if you go to verse 19, right, all that text is there. You can read that. But if you go to verse 19, the very end, he says, so if you're suffering in a manner that pleases God, in other words, if it's not because of bad decisions that you've made, Keep on doing what is right and trust your lives to God who created you. He will never fail you. In other words, don't be surprised and continue to commit yourself to God. Continue to trust and obey. And even as I say that, I am not unaware of how difficult that is. I've experienced suffering in my own life and for, goodness, almost 30 years I've been a pastor and I've watched people who said, I'm real, I'm real, I'm real, I'm the 24 care, I'm, and then when suffering comes into their life, they drift away. You don't any longer see them as part of the family. They feel that God's been unfair to them, and they get angry, and they curse God, and they say, oh, that didn't work. Well, why, again, the Bible's so honest, it says, listen, don't, the Bible's not here telling you that your life is not going to have any suffering. So when it does, you're like, oh man, something must be wrong or God's not real. Well, it tells us right at the beginning, listen, you're going to suffer. John said, in this world, there is tribulation. But be of good cheer. Why? Because God is a God of redemption. All things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. The Old Testament says that that God catches every tear you've ever cried. See, while God hasn't caused the pain that we feel in this world, He has promised to redeem it so that we can become that which the enemy in bringing pain was trying to stop you from becoming. I mean, to remain under is to laugh at the enemy's attempt to destroy you. But yet, it's a decision, right? And so, this is my prayer for me and for you. My prayer is that I will remember and not be surprised. My prayer is also that as you look into the mirror today and you think about suffering in your past, or maybe you're presently going through some really challenging times. See, normally, again, think about it. Normally, we either try to get away from it or downplay it. It's really not that bad. It's just, no, no, there's some things that are really bad and they are really painful and they bring sorrow and grief and tears to our eyes. But as a Christ follower, I have promises from an all-powerful God that he will leverage my hurt to bring about joy on the other side. And so... <clears throat> As you look into the mirror, are you real? As you think about how you've handled suffering, are you real or are you just religious? Would you bow your head? Father, I thank you for your word. And suffering is not anything that any of us look forward to or desire or even enjoy. And yet, I am so grateful that you have pre-warned us so that we won't be surprised. But not only, God, have you pre-warned us, you have promised that you, you will use this suffering to bring about that which the enemy was trying to keep from happening. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your promises. And help us to be or to become the real thing. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.